you know, I've, I've heard you talk in some other interviews about uh, a situation that you were in that was that you described as really sort of impacting your your mental state and to me when I heard you talk about it it seemed to be almost like a turning point mentally psychologically for you and it had to do with you overrunning a position and and you end up with some some yeah I didn't I didn't realize the impact of that incident until many, many years later. But in order for me to explain that, I have to talk about something called moral injury, which is one of the so-called invisible wounds of war. Uh, A lot of people are familiar with post-traumatic stress disorder. A lot of people are aware of traumatic brain injury. But when you ask them if they could describe the invisible wound of war called moral injury, very few people are, are knowledgeable about that. How long has that term been used? Uh, there was a, a uh, psychiatrist at the VA, uh, Dr. Jonathan Shea, who uh, basically uh, coined that phrase in 2009. So it's been around for a while, and now it's starting to really pick up steam in research because of its its significance in contributing to the high suicide rate among veterans. And uh, the concept is, when I go around and I give presentations and and I tell people, the concept is so intuitive, you'll get it in 30 seconds, okay? So here it is. From the time you're born until you're 18 years old, you develop a personal moral code, sense of right or wrong. That could come from your family, your religion, community, friends, whatever. And then you join the military and you learn a warrior code. The warrior code is superimposed on your personal moral code and in fact transforms it somewhat. Then you might have to participate in activities or operations that violate your personal moral code, such as killing. You don't have to be the person that pulls the trigger. You could be a witness, or you could feel that you should have prevented it, or you could be in a unit that follows another unit, and you see that innocent civilians have been killed, or you handle body parts. At that time, you sustain a so-called invisible wound of war called moral injury. It's not a physical wound. You can't see it. But in military operations, we're constantly moving. You're going from point A to point B to point C. You don't have time to stop and reflect on this stuff. So what do you do? You bury it. And it becomes unresolved grief, shame. And what happens is you come back to the States, and let's say you leave the military, or you're in the National Guard or Reserves, and you come back to a community anywhere in the country that doesn't understand what you've been through and it boils up to the surface. And unless you have a strong coping mechanism for that, bad stuff happens. Anger, guilt, depression, suicide. And the suicide rate among veterans today is epidemic. I mean, the VA, it's anywhere from 20 to 22 veterans per day are dying by suicide. And that frankly is underreported. It's really higher than that because you've got veterans who are dying by suicide. It's not reported as a suicide. They'll drive their motorcycle or car into a tree or viaduct, and it's a vehicular accident. Or unfortunately, there's something called suicide by cop where they force the law enforcement officer to take lethal action. And so what's, what's the implication of all that? We lose more veterans to suicide in a year than all the combat deaths since 9-11. That's how dramatic it is. And we believe that moral injury is a major contributing factor to that. And Military Outreach USA, our organization, we feel that the main approach to moral injury is not a medical doctor with prescription drugs. It's the forgiveness and grace of a moral authority and the counseling of clergy and sensitive therapists and the support of a community offering hope and help. 
And so now getting back to that incident mm-hmm. that, that you asked me about, Jocko, uh, I was a you know, company commander, battle company. We had just overrun a uh, Viet Cong position and killed numerous enemy. And I literally had three dead bodies at my feet, okay? Well, the time a unit is most vulnerable is right after a victory. It's just human nature to let your guard down and breathe a sigh of relief. Well, I'm the guy in charge. I know that. So I'm on my radio and I'm kicking rear end and taking names. I'm telling my platoon leaders, reorganize your units, redistribute ammunition, take care of your wounded, look for enemy avenues of approach for a counterattack, right? And in the middle of all that stuff going on, I stopped. And I looked at the three dead bodies at my feet. I realized that something had happened to me Something had hardened my heart. Only moments earlier, these were alive human beings. They had families. They had emotions. They had loved ones. They were fighting for something as important to them as I was fighting for. And I was in their backyard. And then I remember Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where he told us to pray for our enemies. So in the midst of all this stuff going on, I said a prayer. For the three Viet Cong and I know I was praying for myself as much as I was praying for them now you know I didn't have a big ceremony get on my hands and knees any of that stuff you know this all took about 45 seconds but it's something that was seared in my heart and mind for the rest of my life and now that I know about moral injury okay which I didn't know at that time I realize that I was one in a million who was able to address my moral injury at the time it happened. Okay, and you know, I had always, when I came back from Vietnam, I had seen a lot of my comrades having nightmares, having flashbacks, you know, personality changes, and I frankly asked myself, how come I'm not going through that, okay? And at the time, my answer always was my faith and my wife my wonderful wife of now 46 years, who is an angel. I've I've been so blessed having her for a wife. So that was my answer, okay? But now since I've been dealing with Military Outreach USA and this issue of moral injury, I realized that my answer was really lacking, okay? There were two other things. One was that incident in Vietnam that I just mentioned to you. But the other thing, which I now realize, is when I came back from Vietnam, I joined the reserves, okay? And I was able to maintain my sense of purpose of being in a unit with other people who shared the same values that I did, of patriotism, of dedication, of selfless service, which a lot of veterans, when they come back, they just want to cut ties totally, and they, a lot of them drift because they they don't have that sense of purpose. They don't have the camaraderie. They don't have the bonding. You know, I had that with the reservists, Mm -hmm. especially, you know, in Viet, you know, with Vietnam and all the BS that we had to take from the public, you know. I mean, you won't believe this. Well, I I know you know this, but when we came back from Vietnam, we were told not to wear our uniforms Mm -hmm. in public. I mean, that's how bad it was. That's crazy. You know, guys wore wigs. So they, people wouldn't know they had short haircuts, mm. you know, because they could pick them out as, as being military. And so my being in the reserves helped me, you know, maintain that. One of the things that I tell guys is very similar to what you just said. You know, I tell guys you got to find a new mission when you get done. When you get done with the military, you got to find a new mission. And, and if you can stay in the reserves, obviously that, that gives you that. But if you don't do that, well, then you got to find what are you going to do? What are you going to step out there? Are you going to become a great dad? Are you going to build a business? Are you going to work for a company and, and do a great job? Or you, you got to find a new mission. And I, f- I find that guys that I've seen that that have real problems, it's because they, they got out and they didn't know, didn't have any direction to go into. 